Okay. Thanks. Uh, welcome, everyone, and welcome to Massey College. Uh, my name is Satna Sharma, and I am a senior fellow at Massey College. And I actually used to be uh, a junior fellow here while I was doing my graduate uh, degree at U of T, and it was one of the most enjoyable times uh, years past here, so uh, I'm happy to be back. And uh, I'm also a freshwater ecologist and a professor at York University and uh, was inducted to uh, as a member of the Royal Society of Canada College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists this past fall. So this event and this partnership is very dear uh, to my heart. And I'm delighted to be here with all of you today uh, for this special partnership event between Massey College and uh, the Royal Society of Canada on water and the sustainability of our oceans. And before we begin, I would like to give thanks to the land we are on. Massey College is built on land where many Indigenous peoples have lived. It is on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Haudenosaunee peoples. We want to acknowledge our duty of, our, of stewardship towards the land and the great privilege that we have to work on this land. And freshwater sustainability, I'm a freshwater ecologist, and the same goes for marine sustainability, and stewardship of our waters is inherently connected and builds on the traditional knowledge and indigenous relationships to water. At the same time, Canada holds the largest freshwater supply of any nation on this planet. Uh, we are home to over 9 million lakes. Yet still too many indigenous communities do not have access to clean water in their homes. We all have a lot to learn from, our, uh, from indigenous water protectors and collectively advocate for universal access to clean water in Canada and beyond. And that brings me uh, to introduce Professor Frank Deere, uh, who will provide welcoming remarks from the Royal Society of Canada. Professor Frank Deere is the President, College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists at the Royal Society of Canada. He is a professor and associate dean in the Faculty of Education at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Frank is Ganyanakehaka from Ganawaka, a community that lies in the eastern region of the Haudenosaunee Co Confederacy. Welcome, Professor Frank Deere. Nyongo, Satna, Nyongo. Sewa, Sewa, Gwagun. Hello, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. Watkunu Aradun, welcome. Uh, the Royal Society of Canada is pleased to be back at Massey College. Following a series of successful events here prior to the pandemic, the first two of the events of this new series occurred in late 2023. Discussions on health and well being of the elderly, as well as one in the arts and our artificial intelligence. I had the pleasure of attending both of these events in the autumn, and I'm pleased to be here again today for a discussion of the sustainability of our oceans, for which we have some great speakers this evening. Um, I want to say Nyawango in my language. Thank you very much to all who have come to attend in person, as well as everybody who's viewing online. I want to acknowledge the presence of one person in particular, Muriel Laberge. Uh, can you put your hand up there? <laughs> uh, is, yep. <laughs> Muriel is principal of the University of Quebec en Ottawa, and uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about where this particular initiative will be going next year, which will involve, of course, your great uh, institution. Nyango for attending. Really pleased that you're here. Um, my name is Frank, uh, and I'm a professor and associate dean, as was mentioned, at the University of Manitoba. Um, and um, for this series of uh, dialogues, it's important to note that the RSC is composed of four constituent uh, entities, the three academies, and the college, as was mentioned by, by Sapna. And for this series of RSC dialogues, at Massey College, each of these four bodies have been responsible for organizing the four events in the series, which has been a great experience to be a part of. 
The RC College is very excited to be leading the third event in the series featuring, featuring newly elected um, uh, RSC fellow Julie LaRoche. <laughs> and RSC College member, William Chung. Today we will hear from Drs. LaRoche and Chung in a presentation called Water is Life, Sustainability of Our Oceans. They will be joined by Justice Julie Thornburn, a member of the Ontario Court of Appeal. Thank you very much for joining us, Justice Thornburn. This evening, the speakers will explore the topic of water sustainability with focus on habitats and climate change. We will first hear from each speaker, followed by a discussion amongst the three of them, after which we will open the floor to questions from the audience. Of course, people online are welcomed to pose their questions as well. On behalf of the Royal Society of Canada, I'd like to thank Acting Principal Dr. Jonathan Rose and the entire Massey College community for hosting us today, and I'm very much looking forward to today's presentation. I am now pleased to introduce this evening's moderator, Justice Julie Thornburn. Justice Thornburn was appointed to the Ontario Court of Appeal in June 2019. She was appointed to the Superior Court of Ontario in September 2006 and Deputy Judge of the Northwest Territories in 2009. Prior to, report, to her appointment to the Court of Appeal, she was a member of the Ontario Superior Court Judges Association, and she is co-author of a report prepared at the request of the Attorney General of Ontario to improve access to justice for French-speaking litigants. Um, Julie, now go on, take it away. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. I'm, I'm very grateful to you for that. And now I, I, I want to talk about the important part of this discussion, and that is our two speakers. Le sujet qu'on qu va aborder aujourd'hui, c'est l'eau, c'est la vie. Il n'y a pas de sujet plus important que uh, le changement climatique ces jours-ci. Our very survival depends on containing the nefarious effects of climate change and the human behavior that is affecting it. Oceans are crucial for a biodiversity. There's biodiversity, conservation, fish management, and all of these important subjects will be approached today by our very distinguished speakers. These challenges face, faced by all of us, but some are more seriously affected than others. Indigenous peoples, fisher folk, and farmers and a better understanding of indigenous ways may help us reach much more sustainable solutions. So we are very grateful to have not one, but two Canada Research Chairs and very distinguished scholars to help us go through these, this important topic and better understand it. Because knowledge is power, and knowledge will help us better understand what we need to do how we can confront the challenge, and how we can encourage others in our community to do better. Without further ado, I'm now going to introduce our two distinguished speakers. En premier, c'est le professeur William Chung. Le professeur Chung est titulaire de la chaire de recherche du Canada sur la durabilité des océans et le changement climatique, et il est directeur de l'Institut des océans et des pêches de l'Université de la Colombie-Britannique. Il est reconnu pour ses recherches sur les liens entre le dérèglement climatique, la sécurité alimentaire et le maintien de la biodiversité des environnements marins. Il a participé à des initiatives internationales et régionales qui visent à jeter les ponts entre la science et les politiques publiques, notamment le groupe d'experts intergouvernemental sur l'évolution du climat, et la plateforme intergouvernementale, scientifique et politique sur la biodiversité et les services écosystématiques. In 2015, as director of science of the NEUROS program, he led an international team of researchers studying the impact of two potential climate change outcomes on fish migration and its associated ecological consequences. The research was intended to inform discussions on the topic of the 2015 United Nations Climate Change Conference in Paris. 
He also co-authored a report about the future impact of uncontrolled climate change on fisheries in the Pacific Northwest and its effect on First Nations communities which depend on them. And he's involved in several initiatives that bridge science and policy. As he says, unless serious measures are taken, the types of fish that we'll have on our dinner table will be very different decades later than they are now. Le professeur Laroche est aussi titulaire de la chaire de, de recherche du Canada en génomique, génomique microbienne marine et en biogéochimie à l'Université Dalhousie. Elle est une microbiologiste marine qui utilise des approches de biologie moléculaire pour élucider les facteurs qui contrôlent la productivité primaire dans l'océan. Elle a développé plusieurs approches de biologie moléculaire qui ont eu un impact durable sur notre compréhension de la limitation des nutriments dans le phytoplancton et les microbes marins, particulièrement en ce qui concerne la limitation du fer qui est importante dans de vastes zones de la surface des océans. En construisant son laboratoire, elle a développé des approches pour étudier comment les microbes marins et les processus biochimiques sont affectés par le changement climatique mondial. She conducted research at the Brookhaven National Laboratory, flaxodoxin expression as an indicator of iron limitation in marine diatoms, which earned her and her co-author Helen Murray Tobin the Luigi Provasoli Award from the Fi Ficological Society of America for the most outstanding research paper published in the Journal of Phycology. She also studied how stress affects phytoplankton, and in 1998, she accepted the position at the University of Kiel as a professor in their Institute of Oceanography. She developed her own lab to research how global climate change is affecting marine microbes and biochemical processes, and she studied how phytoplankton and marine bacteria are affected by increase in temperature, and decreases in pH. And she's later partnered with Canada C3 on a 150-day expedition along the Atlantic, Arctic, and Pacific coasts to collect and share data. Alors, avant d'aller plus loin, je vais passer le micro à, au professeur Laroche pour, pour faire son discours. Professeur Laroche, à vous. Merci. Vous pouvez m'entendre Oui, ok. Bon, parfait. Euh, D'abord, je voudrais remercier les organisateurs de m'avoir invité à participer à ce dialogue, <coughs> qui est déjà très intéressant. Euh, et euh, ensuite, je vais vous parler beaucoup de microbes ce soir. Euh, donc, euh, euh, des, des, quand on parle de, de l'eau, c'est la vie. Euh, la vie en haute mer, ça commence avec le plancton. Et, euh, qui est à la base de la, fou, euh, de la chaîne alimentaire pour tous les autres organismes dans l'océan. Dans, dans euh, plus de 90 de la productivité des océans est attribuée au, au euh, phytoplancton euh, et, qui, euh, euh, et, et aussi on, on, on sait que euh, dans le passé, euh, la vie a évolué dans les océans. Alors, et que les microbes ont dominé pendant des, des milliards d'années les formes de vie dans l'océan. Euh, donc, les organismes qu'on observe aujourd'hui euh, sont le résultat de l'évolution et de l'innovation euh, constante des métabolismes microbiens euh, qui se sont déroulés euh, au cours de, 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 de passés géologiques. Donc, si on fait un petit retour en arrière, euh, au cours des époques géologiques, euh, l'évolution de la photosynthèse oxygénique euh, a été, euh, chez les cyanobactéries marines, a été euh, instrumentale euh, en développant, le, euh, en, pour augmenter la, la concentration d'oxygène de, de, dans l'atmosphère qu'on respire maintenant. <coughs> Euh, il y a eu plusieurs, euh, plusieurs grandes, euh, grandes décisions dans l'évolution. Dans Donc, euh, un, une des, des étapes, ça a été la grande euh, oxydation euh, qui a eu lieu il y a environ 2,5 milliards d'années et qui a conduit l'évolution des cellules eucaryotes et 
des organismes multicellulaires, multicellulaires aussi, euh, y compris les vertébrés et les plantes terrestres. Pendant très longtemps, alors que toute la vie est encore euh, exclusivement microbienne, il y a eu une série de boucles de rétroaction qui sont déroulées sur plusieurs euh, centaines de millions d'années, tandis que la chimie de, de l'océan et le métabolisme des microbiens s'adaptaient à l'adaptation, à, à l'augmentation de la concentration d'oxygène dans les océans. Et on voit ici, euh, si on suit euh, donc dans le protérosorique, il y a eu le, un développement aussi très fondamental, donc une, une symbiose qui a donné, euh, euh, qui, a, qui a permis euh, l'évolution des chloroplastes. Et puis, à ce moment-là aussi, il y a eu une augmentation de l'oxygène dans, dans l'atmosphère qu'on qu euh, respire aujourd'hui. <coughs> euh, donc, euh, pendant des, des, des milliards d'années, euh, le, les, les organismes vivants qui contrôlaient le, les cycles biochimiques, c'était les, les microbes. Et puis, durant les deux ou trois cent dernières années, l'évolution des, des sociétés humaines modernes, nous avons modifié notre atmosphère maintenant que, et nos océans. Euh, et notre atmosphère et nos océans d'une manière que seuls les microbes étaient capables de faire au, au, dans le passé. Donc, si on, on, on retourne au présent euh, maintenant, euh, donc euh, ici vous voyez une, une composition de phytoplancton, euh, une, une communauté de phytoplancton euh, qui est moderne et puis qui aussi euh, sert à contrôler les, euh, les cycles biochimiques de carbone et euh, d'azote et en fait aussi euh, en partie d'oxygène. Donc, euh, le phytoplancton euh, dans la couche superficielle de, de l'océan euh, euh, libère de l'oxygène durant, durant, durant la journée et aussi la consomme euh, durant la nuit. Pour, pour, pour pouvoir comprendre le rôle des, des, des phytoplanctons et des microbes dans l'écosystème dans marin, on a besoin de regarder leur place dans l'écosystème dans marin. Donc, si vous regardez à, à gauche, euh, est-ce que c'est un... Ouais. Euh, euh, le, le, le système euh, l'écosystème terrestre, euh, terrestre on voit que la production euh, des, des, les, euh, la, la production primaire est euh, contrôlée en fait par euh, la, la croissance des arbres et euh, des plantes euh, terrestres euh, et la biomasse euh, terrestre s'accumule euh, beaucoup très lentement et de, devient pratiquement gigantesque. Donc, on a... Euh, mais de, si on regarde le système marin, par contre, euh, on a souvent des pyramides inversées. Donc, ça veut dire que les, euh, les producteurs primaires sont, euh, euh, en fait, euh, euh, croissent très, très rapidement. Et parfois, on a des doublements à euh, chaque jour. Mais la biomasse ne s'accumule pas parce que euh, elle est broutée par les, euh, euh, les, euh, les herbivores. Et puis aussi, parfois, elle coule dans les eaux profondes. Et souvent, c'est ce qui se passe après, après la production primaire, c'est que les deux sont... Donc, il y a, il y a une, un transfert dans les, euh, dans les eaux plus profondes. Et, et puis, à ce moment-là, on, on retrouve ces pyramides inversées. Donc, le... le le, la croissance des, produ euh, des, euh, des producteurs primaires dans l'océan est très rapide. Oups, au stock. <rire> Can you do it? Hmm? <rire> Merci. Euh, <coughs> OK. Donc, euh, Ici, je vous présente une, en fait, une, une, un graphique qui montre que dans, dans les océans, les, les, les couches de l'eau couches de l'eau sont, euh, sont séparées. Donc, on a une couche superficielle 
euh, qui est, qui est euh, illuminé par le, le soleil. Et puis, on a une couche profonde euh, qui, euh, qui, en fait, qui, où euh, c'est noir et puis il fait froid. Euh, donc, dans la, la couche superficielle, euh, on retrouve le plancton euh, qui euh, faut photosynthèse durant le jour et puis aussi euh, libère l'oxygène dans la couche supérieure. Et puis, euh, dans la couche euh, euh, stratifiée, la couche plus profonde, euh, à ce moment-là, quand le, le phytoplancton euh, coule dans, le, dans les eaux profondes, il y a une, euh, les bactéries qui, euh, qui euh, dégradent euh, la, la matière organique. Et le, le point que je veux euh, euh, préciser d'après ce, ce graphique, c'est que dans la couche superficielle, il y a beaucoup d'oxygène. Et puis l'oxygène est en fait, en, euh, et la, la couche superficielle est en contact avec l'atmosphère, alors l'oxygène peut échanger rapidement. Euh, et puis ensuite, on a la, 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 la production d'oxygène par les phytoplancton. Euh, dans la couche euh, qui est séparée de, de dans la, 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 la couche plus sombre, à ce moment-là, cette eau-là est séparée et n'est plus en contact avec l'atmosphère, et puis l'oxygène est plutôt consumé. Dans, dans ces, dans, euh, par les bactéries et puis d'autres euh, euh, zooplancton. Alors, euh, c'est ce mécanisme-là qui euh, peut euh, produire des zones dans les océans qui sont euh, limitées en, en oxygène. Donc, qui sont, euh, on a des pertes d'oxygène euh, avec euh, euh, quand ces, ces deux euh, euh, couches euh, sont séparées et puis euh, donc, ça peut créer des, des zones d'oxygène déficient, des, des, des déficits en oxygène, et puis aussi euh, ce qu'on appelle des zones mortes. Euh, le phytoplancton a aussi besoin de, de nutriments, donc euh, ils, ils ont besoin de, euh, en plus de, euh, de la lumière du soleil, ils ont besoin de d'azote et puis d'autres éléments pour, euh, pour construire les cellules. Donc, euh, le point de, re, de retenir ici, c'est que l'oxygène est, euh, est plutôt euh, est, est, euh, réduit dans la, couche, dans, dans la couche supérieure. Donc, si euh, avec le réchauffement global aussi, c'est que l'oxygène est moins, euh, euh, se, il y a moins de, de concentration d'oxygène dans la surface euh, de l'eau. Et puis, ça peut aussi réduire la, la, la couche euh, où le phytoplancton est, euh, peut euh, effectuer la, la photosynthèse. Donc, et, et augmenter la, la, la zone plus profonde où on est, limité, on est plus limité en, en, en oxygène. Euh, pour, euh, aussi, pour, euh, si on regarde la diversité de, du plancton, euh, le phytoplancton est très bien caractérisé, euh, assez bien caractérisé, je, je voudrais dire. Euh, on a identifié de 4 000 à 5 000 espèces euh, avec microscopie. Et on, a, on développe de plus en plus des, euh, des systèmes euh, génomiques, euh, génétiques, où on peut identifier plus précisément les espèces de phytoplancton. Euh, mais euh, ce qui est important de, pour le plancton, c'est leur rôle dans l'écosystème. Donc, euh, si on regarde le, le, leur, euh, leur fonction dans l'écosystème, euh, le phytoplancton, c'est la production primaire et aussi euh, l'évolution de l'oxygène. Mais il y a des rôles secondaires aussi qui peuvent, euh, se, euh, comme la fixation d'azote, la production de toxines ou la production de, 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 de matière organique. Si on regarde la partie en bas euh, de, de ce graphique, euh, le, on a le microzooplancton. Le microzooplancton euh, est très, euh, très mal caractérisé euh, euh, sur le côté de diversité, mais encore là, on peut aussi euh, 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 penser à quels sont leurs rôles dans l'écosystème euh, de, de ces microzooplanctons. Donc, euh, leur rôle, c'est de dégrader la. <coughs> C'est dé dégrader la matière organique et puis en, en même temps consommer euh, l'oxygène à partir de la respiration. <coughs> Oups. 
OK. Maintenant, on arrive aux, aux, aux bactéries, aux, aux microbes. Euh, ce qu'on euh, qu caractérise d'habitude par microbes, c'est les, 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 ar les archées et les bactéries. Et puis ici, ce qui est vraiment euh, remarquable chez les, chez, euh, les, les, le, les microbes, c'est leur diversité métabolique. Alors, si on veut voir ici euh, une communauté de différentes espèces de, de bactéries, mais ce qui est important, c'est leur, euh, leur rôle dans l'écosystème. Et puis, on peut voir euh, tous les, les différents métabolismes qui, qui ont été développés pour euh, les microbes. Donc, on a la production du méthane, la consommation, de, euh, cons, euh, consommation du méthane, aussi la production de certains gaz euh, d'effet de, de serre, comme le le N2O. Et puis, il y en a aussi qui euh, fixent le, 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 le carbone comme euh, euh, par euh, chémo, chémo, euh, euh, chémo euh, organiquement. Ah oui, euh, je dirais, si on, a, on a déjà parlé beaucoup d'oxygène, et puis ça va revenir dans, comme thème de, plus tard dans la, ma présentation. Mais ce qui est important aussi avec les, les, les microbes, donc les archées et les bactéries, c'est qu'il y a plusieurs, il euh, y a une large majorité de, de, des bactéries qui sont euh, facultatifs, euh, anaérobes facultatifs. Donc, ça veut dire que Lorsque l'oxygène est, est, est manquant dans, dans l'écosystème, ils vont avoir d'autres manières de respirer euh, qui leur permettent de vivre dans les, zones, euh, dans les zones mortes, par exemple, ou des zones de, de minimum de, en oxygène. OK. Euh, maintenant, on, euh, on suit avec le, le cycle de l'azote dans les océans. Le, donc, c'est un peu un graphique euh, un peu compliqué ici, mais ce qui, ce qui est à retenir, c'est que toutes les flèches que vous voyez dans ce diagramme, c'est des euh, transformations qui sont, euh, euh, qui sont euh, euh, effectuées par des microbes, différents types de microbes. Euh, donc, euh, on a des oxydations, des flèches rouges, euh, les réductions, les flèches noires. Et puis, euh, comme ça, le, le, le cycle de, de, de l'azote qui, euh, qui est important pour euh, donner des nutriments comme le nitrate et l'ammoniac euh, pour les, les phytoplanctons. Et puis, on peut voir encore euh, cette, euh, ces, euh, ces transformations qui peuvent euh, dériver des, des, des euh, gaz à effet de serre, comme le N2O ici que vous voyez, le greenhouse gas. Um, donc, euh, l'autre point encore ici de, de retenir, c'est que euh, ces microbes, euh, il y en a beaucoup, il y a beaucoup de ces réactions dans, dans, dans le cycle de l'azote qui sont strictement anaérobiques. Donc, euh, ils vont seulement se produire s'il y, euh, si y a le manque d'oxygène. Euh, et d'autres qui, euh, qui, qui demandent de, de, de l'oxygène. Donc, euh, OK. Oh, il est là. OK. So, ça, ça veut dire que euh, dans une, une communauté de bactéries euh, que vous voyez ici euh, à, à la droite, euh, en bas des, des différentes bactéries, c'est possible qu'il y, qu y ait des cycles cryptiques qui vont se développer. So, un cycle cryptique, c'est un cycle où euh, une, une transformation de, de, de l'azote ici euh, va compenser pour une autre, pour une autre transformation. Donc, euh, si on regarde la fixation d'azote qui prend le, le, le N2 et qui euh, le fixe dans euh, une matière organique ou euh, l'ammoniac ou euh, l'ammoniac ici, et, et on peut avoir une autre réaction qui va être la dénitrification qui va balancer cette, euh, cet apport d'azote dans le système. Et puis, si on essaie... Quand on regarde euh, par, par observation dans, dans les océans, on ne on on pourra pas détecter ce cycle-là, à moins de prendre des méthodes très sophistiquées, comme euh, regarder des les, les isotopes stables. Euh, mais euh, quand les conditions euh, environnementales changent, à ce moment-là, il y a peut-être un, un, un métabolisme qui va prendre le dessus au, euh, sur l'autre. Et puis là, on peut voir vraiment des changements. Donc, c'est encore relié à ce, qu est en train de, ce qui est en train de, de se passer avec euh, les changements climatiques et les changements de l'océan, de l'eau de l'océan. 
on, on peut euh, plus tard voir euh, qu'il va euh, découvrir qu'il va avoir des changements euh, euh, majeurs à cause de, de le, le, la, 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 la euh, disruption dans ces cycles de euh, ces cycles cryptiques. Ok, euh, même euh, encore plus euh, surprenant, c'est que il y, y a même des bactéries. Là, ici, on regarde euh, la petite cellule brune qui est une bactérie euh, euh, où, dont on, 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 on connaît déjà le génome. Donc, la, la, la petite carte que vous voyez dans, le, dans la cellule, dans la grosse cellule, c'est à partir, ça a été déterminé à partir de, du, de, du génome, donc l'ADN, le séquençage de l'ADN. Et puis, on a vu dans cette cellule qu'il y a des, des protéines, où il y a les gènes pour faire soit la, la, la fixation de l'azote et la dénitrification aussi. Donc, ça veut dire que dans le, dans le, même dans une cellule, euh, c'est possible, il y a tellement de diversité métabolique que la, cette, cette espèce de bactérie pourrait à un point soit fixer l'azote ou soit faire la dénitrification. Donc, c'est comme complémentaire. Et puis, euh, à ce moment-là, c'est le, le, le facteur qui va décider, c'est l'environnement. Qu'est-ce qui va être plus euh, 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 nécessaire, qui, qui va être plus euh, euh, favorable pour euh, la cellule de faire soit la dénitrification ou la fixation d'azote donc, euh, encore ici, ces, ces différentes transformations sont contrôlées par la, la concentration de, de, de l'oxygène euh, dans, dans l'eau de mer. Donc, euh, à différents niveaux d'oxygène, il peut y il peut avoir une, une ségrégation de, de ces différents types de métabolisme. OK. So, I um, missed one here. Oops. <laughs> Can you go back one? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. It's it's good. It's good to get it. Okay. Donc ça, ça me ça me, me rapproche près maintenant de, de du dernier point que je que dernier deux un ou deux points que j'aimerais euh, mettre cette, euh, ce soir, c'est euh, de regarder quels sont les stresseurs dans les océans euh, présentement. Donc, euh, il y a euh, l'oxygène, on a parlé beaucoup d'oxygène, dont l'oxygène qui, qui est en décroissance, qui est en perte dans, euh, dans, dans les eaux intermédiaires. Il y a l'acidification de la mer. Euh, donc, ça, c'est, on voit le H+, ici, c'est que, euh, donc, plus on a d'atomes de, 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 d'hydrogène, plus l'eau est, est acidifiée. Et puis, on a l'augmentation de la température. Euh, ces trois facteurs-là, aussi, on peut voir dans ce triangle, euh, qui peuvent euh, être superposés aussi, ils peuvent euh, 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 être euh, euh, arriver dans le, le, la, la même région. Euh, OK, maintenant, je vais vous montrer deux cartes qui ont été produites par euh, des modèles. Euh, ce n'est pas mon travail, mais c'est quand même... Euh, Oups! OK. Il ne faut pas trop peser souvent là-dessus. Euh, donc, euh, si, euh, si vous regardez la, la, la carte euh, A, euh, à, à gauche, euh, ça, c'est une, une, une carte en surface de, de l'océan global. Et puis, ce qu'on voit là, c'est euh, l'influence... Euh, OK. D'abord, je voudrais expliquer comment ces, euh, ces représentations, ces visualisations ont été euh, produites. Donc, euh, les auteurs de cet, art, de, de cet article ont, ont regardé tous les, euh, les extrêmes de, de température, d'acidité de, et de manque d'oxygène euh, par rapport à la moyenne de plusieurs années. Donc, on a vraiment regardé les extrêmes. Et puis là, on voit qu'en euh, surface, la température, évidemment, et le, le, le pH peuvent affecter... Euh, de certaines régions. Donc, euh, et puis, si on regarde la, la carte à, à droite, euh, c'est à 200 mètres de, de profondeur dans l'océan. Puis ici, on voit aussi que l'oxygène euh, prend un rôle très important comme stresseur dans l'environnement. Donc, euh, si, euh, deux points à retenir de ces, ces graphiques, c'est que 
les, les stresseurs peuvent être superimposés, donc ils peuvent avoir, euh, quand une région est affectée, elle peut être affectée par plusieurs stresseurs. Et puis, que, il y a aussi des effets régionaux. Donc, euh, même si c'est une, une, une carte globale, et puis on voit que l'effet est global, si on regarde euh, précisément donc, euh, les zones côtières et tout ça, il va y avoir des régions où ils, qui vont être plus touchées que d'autres. Euh, OK. Donc, euh, je ne sais pas si vous avez vu la petite étoile euh, rouge qui vient d'apparaître dans le coin de, du golfe du Saint-Laurent, mais là, je voudrais passer à, à de, de la zone globale à la zone euh, régionale. Et puis, on se retrouve maintenant dans, dans le golfe du Saint-Laurent. Et le golfe du Saint-Laurent, ici, vous voyez dans la carte euh, à, à gauche, euh, la flèche. Donc, on regarde la région où la flèche euh, bleue est. Et puis, euh, sur une période d'environ 100 ans, euh, L'oxygène euh, dans la, la couche intermédiaire euh, de, du golfe du Saint-Laurent a beaucoup diminué. Donc, on voit qu'il y a une diminution de, de, euh, dans, dans la concentration de l'oxygène dissous. Euh, euh, environ un tiers de cette de, de décroissance en oxygène a été causée par euh, l'eutrophisation. Euh, donc, l'apport de nutriments, nutriments très fort dans, dans le dans le golfe, mais il y a aussi une, une composition de, de cette réaction ici qui est, qui est supposément due à un changement de, 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 de transport de masse d'eau dans la région. Donc, ça, ça souvent, c'est causé par le, le changement climatique. Donc, quand les eaux réchauffent et puis les courants peuvent changer de direction. Donc, c'est à regarder ici qu'il euh, y a vraiment une perte d'oxygène dans le golfe du Saint-Laurent qui pourrait affecter aussi tous les animaux, euh, les poissons et mammifères marins qui vivent dans la région. OK. Euh, comment, on peut, euh, bon, euh, comment on peut essayer de regarder comment les microbes vont répondre à ces stresseurs? Parce qu'on sait qu'il y a beaucoup de microbes qui sont... Euh, euh, qui peuvent parfaitement bien survivre dans les zones euh, mortes ou les zones euh, de, de, euh, qui sont, euh, où, où on retrouve les pertes d'oxygène. Donc, comment on peut euh, essayer de comprendre qu ce qui va se passer? Euh, J'ai à droite ici euh, une série de, 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 de types de recherches qu'on fait pour essayer de comprendre parce qu'il faut vraiment regarder à la grande échelle. Donc, si on a besoin de modèles, et puis euh, les modèles euh, régionaux, et puis les modèles globaux. Et puis, ces modèles-là, ils sont guidés par euh, des, les expériences, les cultures et des, des euh, taux de, des mesures, des mesures qu'on fait, dans, dans, euh, euh, qu fait dans, dans, sur le terrain. Euh, aussi, pour les microbes, le, ce qui a, été vraiment, euh, influence, euh, qui a vraiment influencé le... le, le euh, le, 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 le fil de la région, de, le type de recherche qu'on fait, c'est de regarder avec euh, la, la génomique et puis euh, le séquençage de différents types de, euh, de, de méthodes moléculaires. Euh, aussi, euh, ce qui est très important, c'est d'avoir des séries temporelles où on peut regarder les changements et évaluer euh, la, euh, la réponse euh, interannuelle ou inter, euh, de, avec les saisons et tout. Euh, okay. euh, la, le, mon dernier point, c'est de regarder qu'est-ce qu'on pourrait potentiellement euh, mitiguer dans, dans le changement global. Euh, euh, donc, euh, il y a plusieurs approches maintenant qui euh, regardent euh, euh, qu on pourrait, euh, comment on pourrait... Euh, séquestrer le, le, le dioxyde de carbone dans les océans. Euh, il y a toute une, une industrie qui s'est développée alentour de Marine Carbon Dioxide Removal, so MCDR. Euh, et puis, euh, une, une des approches qu'on prend à, 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 à Halifax, c'est euh, d'ajouter de l'alcalinité dans la surface de l'eau. Euh, qui euh, va rétablir le pH de l'eau, euh, mais aussi euh, permettre à, 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 
euh, permettre la prise de, de, de CO2 additionnel dans, dans ces, dans ces régions-là. Donc, euh, ce que vous voyez ici, c'est un article qui a été écrit dans Science et puis euh, euh, qui montre euh, différents types d'approches de, 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 pour essayer de, de, de prendre plus de, de CO2 dans les océans. Ici, ce que vous voyez, c'est la rhodamine qui a, qui a été ajoutée euh, à, lors, lors de, de, du rejet de, de l'alcalinité pour euh, essayer de suivre euh, le déploiement, le, de, le, la, la dissolution euh, de, de, de cette plume. Euh, OK. Je vais retourner en, en arrière. Euh, la dernière... Euh, oups. Oups. <rire> OK. Euh, bon. Okay. Parfait. Donc, le, le, ajouter de l'alcalinité en, en, en eau de surface peut aussi permettre de combattre l'acidification. Et puis, euh, euh, l'autre point qu'on pourrait peut-être mitiguer dans le futur, c'est euh, l'hypoxie, donc le manque de la perte d'oxygène dans les zones côtières et régionales. Euh, en, en ajoutant de l'oxygène dans, le, dans les zones intermédiaires de, euh, euh, de la colonne d'eau. Donc, euh, ça, ça pourrait être euh, accouplé aussi avec euh, les nouvelles euh, 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 méthodes, pour, euh, les, les nouveaux euh, types d'énergie qu'on va développer, comme les éoliennes et puis euh, les, euh, produire de, de l'hydrogène à partir de l'hydrolyse de l'eau qui va, qui va euh, libérer de l'oxygène. Et puis cet oxygène-là, présentement, l'industrie euh, ou le, le, le secteur pu, euh, privé euh, juste pense de, de le, re, le rejeter dans l'atmosphère. Alors peut-être qu'il y a une façon d'utiliser cet oxygène pour essayer de combattre un peu les, 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 les zones mortes dans l'océan. Euh, comment euh, on, on marche en avant avec ces différents types de mitigation. Euh, euh, donc, on a besoin de recherche. Euh, dans, dans, qui, comment ça pourrait affecter les, euh, les, les biotes et les microbiomes dans les océans. Et puis, si regardez, euh, euh, on a besoin de support de communauté et puis euh, s'assurer que les... les, les euh, euh, les approches qui vont être utilisées vont être équitables pour les communautés dans lesquelles euh, ils vont être développés. Et euh, aussi, essayer de, de travailler avec l'industrie, le, le secteur euh, privé, pour voir comment on, on, imp on implémente des, euh, les, po les, les polices, euh, les règlements pour euh, essayer de... de euh, pour préserver l'environnement quand on essaie même de, de mitiguer les effets de, de, de changement climatique. OK. Euh, C'est euh, maintenant juste, juste pour dire que j'ai une grosse équipe et puis euh, tout ça ne sera, serait pas possible sans les collaborateurs et euh, tous ceux qui m'ont aidé à faire ce travail. Donc, c'est pour moi. Votre excellente présentation. Euh, on est bien conscient maintenant des défis euh, à aborder. Uh, and we're going to pass now to uh, Professor Chung, uh, who's going to talk to us about the sustainability of our oceans. So over to you, Professor Chung. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Julie, for a uh, really wonderful explanations of the functioning of the ocean systems. And I think uh, this really set uh, a very good stage uh, for the um, for the uh, for my for my part of the presentations. Uh, so I think uh, we are showing a slide that is towards the end. Let me flip it um, towards the, uh, the the beginning. While I'm doing so, I want to ask you a question. Um, how many of you have uh, eaten fish or seafood uh, in this week? Quite a few of you. And how many of you do you know um, where these seafood are from? OK, <laughs> that's very good. Yeah, that's, yeah, this is a very informed uh, group. Uh, most people don't even they have eat, eaten seafood that they may not know where they are from. Uh, 
So, um, and today's uh, in, in my part of the uh, presentations, I will talk a lot about um, the importance of the oceans and the connections of the oceans to people. And one of the linkages between people and the ocean is through food and seafood. And that would also uh, um, be a really good illustration of how climate change uh, would play a role um, in affecting the oceans, affecting uh, the sustainability, as well as affecting people. And what, can we, what we can do in order to uh, address these, um, these uh, challenges. So this is a, um, a what we call a conceptual diagram of the, uh, my uh, perceptions of how the oceans are linked to um, the oceans, uh, marine life, uh, and people. Um, the oceans are um, uh, connected to marine biodiversity. They provide habitats, as uh, Julie mentioned, uh, provide food, provide energy, provide nutrients to support uh, the diversity of life in the oceans. Uh, and uh, human society are also heavily dependent on the oceans. Uh, through uh, and and we from there we get uh, a lot of benefits uh, for food, for livelihood, uh, for culture, as well as for many other aspects of well-being. The oceans also do a big job for us to in mod moderating uh, our climate, as Julie explained. It absorbs carbon dioxide, uh, absorbs heat. Uh, so without the oceans, uh, our planet would not be livable. And uh, but in in when we are actually uh, getting benefits from the oceans. Uh, often we are also uh, impacting the ocean, particularly when we don't do um, our, uh, get our benefits carefully and we do things excessively. So for example, with excessive carbon dioxide emissions, uh, we are getting too much of a carbon dioxide into the uh, oceans as well as too much heat in the oceans. That leads to the things that Julie mentions, ocean warming, ocean deoxygenation, um, ocean acidification, and that would then affect marine life. Uh, fish and invertebrates, and I will talk a little bit more about how they would be affected, and that would then in turn um, affect the benefits that we can get from these uh, marine ecosystems. Also, the, when we are interacting with the oceans, uh, we may also have uh, negative impacts on marine ecosystems through overexploitation, pollution, habitat change, invasive species, and other changes. And there are already a uh, lot of studies and international assessments showing that uh, the decline in marine biodiversity that we have seen in the past century are really driven a lot by these uh, human activities. And that also affects the ocean's ability to mitigate uh, climate change. And um, these figures um, show the amount of benefits that we get uh, from the ocean, through um, particularly for our seafood. Uh, this is a, a, a data that shows the global productions of seafood uh, from both fisheries and aquaculture. Aquaculture in the oceans, we call it marine culture. And uh, what it shows is that uh, we have peak fish, um, similar to peak oil. We have peak fish in 1990s. And after that, uh, fish production doesn't increase. And in fact, it decreased um, because of overexploitation. And right now, the most of the fish stock are either fully or overexploited. Some may even be collapsed. Even if we have a really rapid expansion of marine farm uh, aquaculture, so which is shown by the gray line here, the increase is actually not able to compensate for the decrease in wild capture fisheries. And uh, so we are really at the crossroad of um, oceans and seafood sustainability here. We can do business as usual that uh, with a continued declines of the oceans, uh, biodiversity, uh, seafood resources, or we can actually bend the curve of the decline and uh, revert it so that we can actually re recover and restore um, the biodiversity, the benefits um, potential that we can get uh, from the oceans. Um, but we have to uh, work on it with uh, different, different dimensions of uh, actions in order to achieve uh, desirable and, uh, and sustainable ocean futures. And to do that, we need to address one of the cost-cutting issues uh, or challenges that we are facing for the oceans, for land, and for fresh water, which is climate change. And uh, climate change uh, through ocean warming, acidification, and deoxygenation are really affecting uh, many aspects of uh, marine biodiversity. And that would also challenge our ability to manage the oceans or conserve biodiversity. So for example, we know that from observations in the past century that uh, as the oceans get warmer and uh, the ocean condition changes, distributions of marine species, fish, invertebrates, uh, they change. 
uh, because marine life, uh, fish and invertebrates, um, and other marine organisms, they really preferred a certain marine conditions to live. And when conditions change, and but for example, when temperature become too hot for them, and if that's sustained, many of the marine organisms will have trouble in functioning in terms of their biology. And when that conditions uh, becomes too, too intense, uh, then uh, they will die. But many species are able to respond by changing their distribution so that they can find um, area where they are suitable to live. So cooler wet waters, po uh, mostly in high latitude regions or uh, in deeper water. However, that creates challenges in the way that um, the ecosystem is functioning as well as in our way of managing um, the oceans or conserving biodiversity. So for example, um, these changes in species distributions will create new interaction between species. Um, and that uh, often will disrupt ecosystem functions and structure. It also affects our ability to manage fisheries uh, for biodiversity. For example, uh, sometimes uh, we want to try to avoid catching some of the non-target species, such as um, those that are charismatic, like uh, marine mammals, or those that are endangered. And the changing distributions of uh, species may increase uh, overlap of uh, the uh, species that are targeted by fishing with these uh, non-target species that we want to conserve. Okay. At the same time, okay, um, if we set up a marine protected areas for a particular species and the species change their distributions and move away from the protected area, so the protected area's effectiveness will decrease. Um, at the same time, um, species uh, fish or invertebrates, uh, they change the distributions uh, moving across the oceans uh, and they don't need visa. They look like us, so we need to, when we cross the borders, we need uh, uh, travel documents, uh, but for them, uh, uh, they would do that uh, depending on the biology and the ecology. But uh, the way we manage the oceans are really um, bounded by those uh, political jurisdictions. Um, so, uh, for example, a shift in species across boundaries would also often uh, pose challenges in transboundary resource uh, ma uh, management, as well as transboundary uh, biodiversity conservation. And we are already seeing these changes in the past few decades or half a century. Um, in when we analyze um, record of um, fish stocks, uh, record of fisheries catches from around the world, uh, we find that um, in the last four or five decades, uh, the species uh, that are represented in, uh, in catches as well as in um, survey scientific survey records uh, are increasingly dominated by species that are more, dom uh, more adapted to warmer waters, as warmer water species. Because, uh, and that changes is related to ocean warming. So uh, in this figure, for example, um, in the uh, area outside of the tropical area, you see that uh, the species are increasingly dominated by red and yellow fish, which is deep, uh, here uh, uh, indicating a species that are, are more warm water uh, affiliated. However, in the tropics, uh, it is the warmest part of the ocean, um, and uh, as the ocean temperatures continue to increase, uh, we don't know that uh, some species uh, may actually not be able to adapt to the temperatures uh, because the temperatures go beyond what they can adapt to and there's no species to move into those waters. Uh, and so at the end, um, it, uh, the, the species are more um, dominated by those tolerant species while the diversity of species in the tropical waters decrease because it loses some of the species that are less resilient to warmer water. And we are already seeing that um, that's happening in our fisheries. At the same time, besides the changes in distribution, species are moving away from the tropics uh, to high latitude regions. Um, the, uh, it also combined with um, the global changes in ocean productivity. So the energies that are captured by the planktons that Julie mentions, that then uh, go through the food chain um, to um, the fish and, uh, and, and other marine life that then provide um, the resources for, uh, for, for, for seafood. Um, and and with, with, with the combination of these, uh, uh, we uh, analyze um, data with uh, scientific modeling, and uh, we find that um, along the tropics, um, those are the area where uh, we would be uh, seeing uh, a large decrease in potential fisheries catches, which is highlighted by the deep blue area here. 
And unfortunately, it really overlapped with those regions um, that are really dependent on fish and seafood as a source of nutrients, um, protein, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, zinc, iron. Those are really important for their health. And those countries that are strongly uh, dependent on seafood uh, for their food and nutrients are highlighted uh, by the uh, orange and, and yellow color there. So unfortunately, it really overlap with uh, the blue color um, that shows the decrease in catch potential. So that really creates uh, a, a loss of risk and vulnerability to people who are most dependent on seafood. <coughs> but those countries in the more, for example, in the high income countries, in high latitude countries uh, are not um, really safe uh, from these impacts. Uh, because within the country, um, there are also a lot of differences in terms of their vulnerability of different groups of people to uh, these impacts. Uh. Take British Columbia as an example. Um, we uh, work with uh, coastal First Nations in British Columbia. And uh, we find that they are uh, much more uh, dependent on seafood compared to the rest of the populations. And in our projections, we also show that uh, those species that uh, uh, coastal First Nations are tra traditionally dependent on as source of food and, and, and as well as in supporting uh, their traditional cultures are projected to decrease uh, under climate change. Um, and these species include salmon, uh, halibut, uh, ulican. Um, those are really important uh, species for them culturally. And also, because of that strong cultural relationship, it is not really easy for them to shift to species uh, that may, uh, may be more abundant in the future uh, because of that uh, long history of traditional relationships with these species. Um, and so um, these uh, climate change will also have adverse impacts uh, of vulnerable populations within those countries as well. So what we are now need is to identify um, equitable and sustainable ocean futures uh, and solution options that would really be able to address uh, multiple um, societal challenges, food security, climate change, biodiversity conservation. Uh, and we need to identify those solution options that can have co-benefits uh, across these different dimensions, as well as the need to address potential trade-offs or negative consequences as associated with any solution options. Uh, for example, whether solution options uh, such as, say, marine uh, uh, carbon, cap, uh, removal, uh, uh, carb carbon um, dioxide removal technologies, would whether they have negative consequences of biodiversity or food. Um, so those are things that we really need to um, understand. Um, and I'm going to mention two um, examples of uh, potential uh, opportunities for uh, these triple co-benefits for food, climate, and biodiversity in the oceans. The first example that I want to mention is um, the removal of harmful fishery subsidies. And we know that uh, one of the big drivers of overfishing is uh, harmful subsidies that government give to fishing. Um, so both those are basically government are subsidizing fishing, even sometimes the resources are depleted and not viable for, for economically viable for, for fishing. But then with subsidies, the fisheries can continue to go on even with uh, overexploited fish stocks. Uh, and we know that by removing those harmful subsidies, uh, we can reduce uh, excessive fishing. At the same time, um, Overfishing really reduce the big biomass of the oceans. As Julie mentioned, that the in the oceans, top predators um, keep a, a lot of biomass um, compared to a lower trophic level. And with the removal of the biomass, uh, it really removes a lot of the capacity of the oceans uh, in sequestering carbon dioxide as well. The carbon kept in, the in these top predators, as well as um, the uh, sequestrations of these uh, top predators, uh, of their carbon uh, to the sea bottom through uh, the waste that they produce, organic waste that they produce, or the dead bodies of these organisms that sink to the sea bottom. So by removing uh, uh, harmful fishery subsidies, it can rebuild uh, these uh, top predators in the oceans, and that would increase uh, seafood availability to coastal dependent communities, where these uh, top predators are really important source of food for them. Uh, it can also uh, result in more equitable sharing of resources, because particularly for uh, Oceans are um, large predatory species, such as uh, tunas and, um, uh, and, and, and bluefish. Uh, those fisheries are only targeted by a handful of fisheries uh, that have the capacity to go out to the uh, open oceans to fish. But then in doing so, it reduced the ability of uh, the coastal communities to catch those fish. So by reducing those fishings, uh, with by removing first subsidies, rebuilding fish stocks, uh, and more fish going into the coast, it can also mean that more fish are available to coastal communities as well. And of course, uh, rebuilding over exploited fish stocks will also help biodiversity. 
Another example that I want to mention is um, the uh, indigenous camp gardens, uh, which um, is, uh, uh, is, is a pra practice uh, in British Columbia uh, a, uh, by uh, indigenous uh, coastal First Nations in there, um, where um, they built um, these uh, structure, uh, stone structures along the coast uh, that would enhance the, um, the populations uh, of uh, clam and uh, also make it more easy access uh, to the clam resources as well. While uh, also that would enhance uh, climate productivities to coastal First Nations. Um, at the same time, based on our research, uh, we find that uh, the clams are one of the species that are more uh, adapted or more resilient to warmer waters. So they are also a, a potential source of more uh, reliable seafood as the oceans uh, continue to warm up. While these uh, structures are created uh, uh, as clam gardens, also provide habitats for other species to live, so enhance biodiversity, and then uh, it also helped maintain uh, a traditional cultures that uh, coastal First Nations have been practicing. So again, this uh, this is uh, one of the um, the the, um, the solution options that have these uh, co-benefits across these three dimensions. And these are just uh, a handful of examples of what we call uh, nature-based solutions uh, to, um, to address this, uh, to address climate change, uh, address biodiversity conservation, and as, uh, also address food securities. And there are many other nature-based solutions that has been assessed that shows high feasibility, high effectiveness to re reduce climate risk, um, as well as high confidence in terms of their, uh, their, uh, their, their use and, and, and the knowledge behind it. Uh, this is uh, based on a, an assessment by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, However, one of the uh, things that is not mentioned here is that many of these solution options uh, will become ineffective or inefficient uh, when, uh, as the uh, climate change continue to intensify with higher global warming. So for example, you can imagine that the clam garden would not work uh, when oceans become too hot, when there's a heat wave hitting the, uh, the coast, uh, or when ocean desiccation becomes too intense that the, the clams are being affected. So one of the preconditions for these solutions is for good mitigation. So it is not a replacement of climate mitigations. It is in addition to climate mitigation that we can actually help com uh, communities, help uh, organisms, help our diversity, and help people uh, to uh, transition through the, the near-term impacts uh, while we are continuing with uh, effective long-term uh, climate mitigations. Um, so with that, uh, I want to thank you and um, would uh, happy would be happy to continue the discussions uh, with you. Thank you. That was, that was very, very interesting. Thank you so much uh, for a very engaging and interesting presentation. It's sobering, uh, but uh, very informative. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, it is a time to ask questions. Uh, si vous vous sentez plus à l'aise de poser vos questions en français, ça me ferait grandement plaisir de... de Euh, de traduire les questions parce que je pense que le professeur Chung ne parle pas français mais euh, on est ici pour vous servir dans les deux langues officielles donc euh, si jamais vous, euh, vous avez envie de poser vos questions en français n'hésitez pas uh, So ladies and gentlemen feel free to ask your questions in English or French it really is fine uh, in both um, So uh, maybe uh, I will start off just by asking a question to the two of you now um, what do you see are the primary obstacles to, su to successful climate adaptation for, for ocean and coastal uh, ecosystems? So maybe I will start first. Uh, I think this is a really important question. Uh, I think um, there are, we know that there are uh, many climate adaptation options that are available, but often um, there are also a lot of obstacles that prevent um, local communities, um, um, different sectors in implementing those adaptation options. Uh, so I, I, I maybe I, I highlight three aspects. Uh, the first aspect is uh, knowledge and information. Uh, and that's not only about um, the scientists generating the knowledge, which is really important, um, but then it's also um, effectively communicating those knowledge um, to um, the, um, the, the stakeholders, uh, to those people and sectors who need those information to implement uh, adaptation in a timely manner, uh, particularly in a world where we are really responding to a loss of these uh, climate emergencies uh, in a really short time frame. Let's take, uh, extreme climate events that happens uh, with uh, really short notice uh, and we need information uh, uh, really uh, quickly in order to, uh, for the communities, uh, for the stakeholders, in order to respond and uh, adapt to those changes. 
The second component is capacity. So uh, ca capacities uh, involve uh, from, um, uh, from, from the ability to utilize the knowledge that we pro pro provide um, to um, the uh, financial capacity or infrastructure capacity to uh, implement those kind of adaptations. Uh, and one of the challenges that sometimes when we engage with stakeholders uh, in discussing climate adaptation is that uh, uh, even though if we provide them with a uh, lot of information, uh, they don't have the capacity to process it uh, in, uh, in a way that they are useful for them. Or that uh, they don't have the, uh, um, the, the infrastructure um, to do that. So when we, for example, when we talk about uh, having uh, with, with uh, coastal first nations, how they can increase their availability of seafood under climate change, uh, they said um, that uh, one of the major obstacles for them is to not uh, have, for example, enough uh, processing capacities of seafood. So you, even though if they have access to more available seafood, they don't have the uh, uh, capacity to process those seafood uh, for, for, for the community to use. Uh. So I think understanding what is needed in terms of building those capacities is needed. And the third dimension is um, institutional barriers. Uh. So really, climate change is such a cost-cutting issue that really challenge um, traditional institutional barriers. Uh, um, governments or uh, um, local um, municipalities, they are often structured in a way that uh, um, make a dialogue and communication um, on issues that are needed to connect uh, in discussing how to address and respond to climate change uh, um, difficult. Um, so breaking those barriers, uh, breaking <coughs> those silos are, are very important uh, uh, obstacle to overcome. Thank you. Uh, Professor Laroche, did you have anything you would like to add to that? Uh, <coughs> yes. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, William made a very good point during his presentation that all these adaptations are going to be short term. So unless we control the climate in, uh, in a major way. So um, there are um, obviously uh, coastal adaptations, so um, movement, in, especially in the north, I think it's, it's really important that like, there will be adaptation to um, uh, melting ice and then changing of, of prey, of uh, hunting practices and so on. So there, um, you know, it's going to be a short-term benefit. Um, it's possible to adapt to a number of situations that, like uh, William presented. Um, <coughs> also, uh, what happens though is like it, there's a whole social um, uh, movement that goes behind that, that you know, if, if uh, the species that are being uh, fished or hunted move their habitat and move up north, then who does the fish uh, belong to at some point, right? So we had a situation like that recently about the scallops in uh, the East Coast, uh, where because the uh, scallop is very sensitive to temperature and they're, they're moving north and they're coming to Canada from the United States and then you know, there's, there's uh, like also uh, fishing uh, quotas and so on that are being uh, challenged there. So um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a global problem to some extent that, that we have to, um, you know, talk, talk to our neighbors and talk to uh, the global community. And, and, and if I saw your uh, slides correctly, it looks like some of the most vulnerable communities, I mean some of the most vulnerable communities within Canada, the coastal communities, the indigenous communities, and around the world, a lot of the most vulnerable communities, lots lots of countries on the coast in Africa that are already horribly impoverished, they're going to be you know, more severely affected than some others. We all re seem to recognize this at some level. And we all say, yeah, yeah, climate change is real. Most of us have now acknowledged that climate change is real. Uh, and, and we need to do something about it. How do we make the penny drop for ourselves and for our governments? How uh, and y I know you, in particular, Dr. Chung, have been involved in b both the policy side and the research side. The research is inc incontrovertible. Um, how do we make our governments affect real change? There seem to be innumerable obstacles, even, even with governments that seem disposed to take the issue seriously. So what can we do as individuals? What can we do as communities to try to take this m more seriously and have others take it more seriously. Any thoughts? Um, you want to start or? Yeah. Uh, oh, I mean, um, I, can, I can say something. So, um, so um, you know, there are a lot of, uh, of people and industry, the industry is really developing very fast for green energy. Uh, so uh, at this stage, it looks like 
it's it's a uh, try a whole bunch of things and then um we're hoping that uh, you know that what we'll pick up is the the methods that are likely to uh, to yield the real results so the issue that uh, for example the the work that um, some companies are doing in the the Bedford Basin that is the Halifax Harbor where to uh, look at the alkalinity enhancement to remove the CO2 from the, um, the atmosphere into the surface water. So um, that, in principle, uh, the approach is very um, sound theoretically, so that it should work. Uh, the issue there is that we need to figure out if it's going to have a ma massive um, a major effect on the environment, on the biota, on the living organisms, uh, and uh, also the industry, the private sector, has to go very fast because it is a very big competing industry, and the regulations don't keep up with, uh, uh, you know, the the industry, the development. So this is really important, where the government really has to uh, figure out what needs to to uh, be done, and uh, in collaboration, possibly with researchers, deciding what needs to be measured to have a sound policy that we know we're not gonna. Uh, cause additional problems to the environment if we try to, to mitigate in, in some way. So, uh, you know, it is a, a, a trio here of the government, the researchers, and the industry, the private sector, that needs to come and then and, and discuss and go at a pace that is manageable for, for all three. Because we know policies change a little bit slower than, than the industry. And, and I guess that's part of the problem, too, because we've got the I issues about We've got economies that are dependent on energy, uh, and and people don't seem to be inclined to conservation. What is the role of conservation? I mean, we would talk about you know now we need to go to wind and solar and all these other things, but maybe it's also turning the temperatures down, uh, taking public transportation. How do we get people to uh, to understand the implications of these things? Dr. Yeah. Chair? I think that's a really good point. And I think as an individual uh, in the society, there are also a lot of things that we can do. Um, and we uh, need to recognize the importance of having a um, seat um, in the um, different actions that can grow into something that have a bigger ability to transform the society. And often people don't appreciate um, the individual effort that as, a, as, as a seat uh, for these bigger efforts. Uh. So, uh, because I think uh, the bigger changes of societies are, are really uh, part of the uh, the actions of individuals um, in the community. Um, so, uh, the it means that uh, we need to um, uh, put more um, recognize the the importance of these uh, smaller actions. Um, so, for example, uh, actions may be in uh, in a co small community that start to um, develop actions of. Um, more uh, efficient energy uses, uh, reductions in um, in the uh, carbon footprints um, in the uh, in the operations of the city, or that uh, adaptations of um, of of, um, of climate change that may seem to be a small scale. Um, for example, um, in one of the communities that we work with, um, they are self-organizing a workshop uh, of uh, this is a fishing community um, to to um, to to teach um, the within their community how to uh, potentially uh, have access to um, fish resources that may become more available to them uh, as the fish, fish uh, shift their distributions um, so that they can get more prepared. Uh, this may sound like a small actions, but then um, it provide a, 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 um, an example that can then grow into something much bigger that can spread to the regions, the countries, and, and this is just an example. It also includes um, other, um, um, uh, other, other conservation actions or uh, other um, climate actions as well. Um, and, and then in addition to that, um, there are also things that um, needs to be implemented um, by the government. And um, in many contexts, uh, kind of example, uh, it really required uh, support from the citizens. Um, so uh, having, providing that uh, support, uh, identifying the policies that would be uh, positive to climate actions and providing the support in implementing those policies would also be a really good way that individual can contribute to these uh, bigger climate actions. Uh. And, and how do you see the carbon tax as helping? Do you see that as an effective way to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish in terms of taking some real stands and doing that, or in terms of your experience in, in policy and, and to affect this kind of change and recognition about climate change? 
Yeah, I think um, there are uh, various um, um, uh, financial instruments um, that can help with providing the incentive to to um, to uh, reduce emissions, and I think uh, climate. A carbon tax is an important uh, one of those important instruments, uh, particularly when it is implemented uh, um, uh, uh, with with careful design. Uh, and and um, so I think this is one of the options, uh, one of the uh, one of the package of solution options that needs to be implemented. And it's not the only one. Uh, it needs to a whole portfolio of actions um, in order to be effective. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, both of you and Professor Laroche uh, as well, what, what do you see as the most effective, if you were to say your top three things that we could be doing to affect the kinds of changes that we need before it's too late, what would you say? Well, um, I think that uh, William also mentioned that, uh, that you know, we have to reduce emissions. So that's, that is definitely something that... Uh, the government and the citizens have to do that. Um, we have to uh, m move to towards uh, renewable energy. So I don't think there's anything that will compensate for trying to reduce the emission or trying to go to uh, net zero carbon emission um, as soon as, as fast as possible. So that would say that's the first course of action and, uh, you know, um, there's always the, 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 there's something that goes on in the, the, with communities and so on, and it's like not in my, not in my backyard, you know. It's uh, uh, what we call NIMBY, so not in my backyard. Um, you know, the wind farms are good, but not in my backyard. And it's true that it would be annoying to have this running all day. Um, but uh, so um, I think the you know industry researchers governments it's not just uh, individual nations but it's a global problem so it has to be tackled at the global scale with uh, and you know collaboration between nations and so on that's what I would say that the government has to uh, they have to step up and then uh, you know get a plan a, a global plan. <laughs> I, I would say that um, um, it is important to recognize that um, the um, uh, climate change are also felt differently by different people. Um, so um, there are um, different groups of people who are uh, much more vulnerable to climate change impacts than others. Uh, and it is important to recognize uh, these groups either within the countries, within the community, or, or internationally, so that um, uh, we can um, also d then um, design our priorities uh, in our actions, so addressing um, the, um, the, uh, the risk and impacts uh, that are felt by these uh, groups of people, because um, those will be uh, already be impact uh, already are impacted, um, and I would like I would continue to be even more impacted as as climate change continue to intensify, it, um, and uh, they uh, there are um, many uh, urgent needs uh, to to support their um, adaptations as well as uh, highlighting the importance of uh, mitigations uh, for their um, uh, long longer term well being. Well, I do like hearing the sound of my own voice, but I'm, but I'm uh, wondering if any of you out here have other questions that you'd like to ask these distinguished uh, panelists. Is there anybody that has any here, question over here? Yeah, uh, before my question, I want to clarify a uh, detail with Professor Chung. You showed a uh, map which had the micronutrient deficiency by country of both Christoph. Are you talking about protein or like vitamins and minerals and the, you know, the micro micronutrients? Are, which one? Thank you. Um, those are micronutrients. Uh, so we look at um, across the different micronutrients um, and uh, identified um, the um, the um, the amount of uh, the estimated amount of uh, nutrients uh, that are sourced from fish um, from those um, countries uh, for 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 the populations. Uh, and then um, we identified those communities, uh, those countries where when fish populations decrease, if fish population decrease, uh, they will be, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the, uh, the availability of those nutrients will be actually drops below um, what they need to sustain um, the, uh, a healthy diet. Uh, so that's, that's, um, that's how we identify those uh, uh, vulnerable uh, countries to uh, nutrient deficiencies uh, as, as fish decrease in their av availability. most likely they would increase agriculture, right? So how that would impact a lot of those regions have tropical rainforests, for example. So I was wondering, 
uh, about that trade-off. There's like an implicit trade-off. If we're getting less food from here, we need to uh, you know, use another ecosystem. So I was wondering how bad is the situation in the oceans compared to those other ecosystems that we might be increasing stress? That's a very good point. Um, so we are only showing the pictures in the oceans, but it is um, the whole food systems and, uh, and, and the ecosystem are interconnected. Um, so, um, uh, and, and, um, so there are two things. One is that a, a lot of those um, um, communities, uh, coastal communities, who are most dependent on seafood, um, they have actually limited access to alternative source of protein. So it is not so easy for them to substitute uh, fish protein uh, to other source of proteins like um, uh, livestock. Uh, and, and secondly, as you said, uh, the, uh, the livestock um, um, is also being affected by climate change as well. Uh, and often tropical area is also the hotspot of impacts. Um, and then uh, for the oceans, uh, people may think that uh, they can farm more fish. Uh, but um, right now, um, we also find that uh, climate change will also affect uh, fish farming. And then secondly, uh, fish farming also, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, species that are being farmed are, are also strongly dependent on wild capture fisheries because they need the fish meal and fish oil in order to as, 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 as a source of, uh, of feed um, for these species. Uh, so what it means is that um, the changing availability of um, capture fishery seafood uh, also affects uh, those uh, farmed uh, seafood, that, uh, seafood as well. So it, it's really, uh, um, there's, there's no um, currently um, easy solutions uh, to deal with it with, uh, with uh, unmitigated climate change. Yeah, so I was going to say uh, there's also research that's been done on uh, multi-trophic uh, aquaculture and then that also plans to perhaps uh, incorporate that into uh, offshore wind farms and so on. So use infrastructure that would be developed in the for offshore, offshore wind farms and build um, a kind of like multi-trophic aquaculture there with seaweed and then fish and so on. So that would be more like recreating an ecosystem there. Uh, and uh, now we have an, a question online. Um, I'm not sure what the question is. So, uh, ah, yes. Uh, the question is from Charles Corey. Is there any current research being done to understand the impact of CO2 capture and storage in geoformations in proximity to our oceans? Um, yeah, so um, at Dalhousie University, we have uh, new programs that uh, where there will be researchers that are looking um, into these types of questions. For example, where will it be a good place to sequester this type of, uh, uh, do this type of sequestration? Um, um, geologists and geo, um, geochemists are, are, are better, or geomorphologists are better informed to, to do this type of research, but it, it, there's definitely work going, going on on this. Um, I'm not too familiar with exactly what, but there's a lot of people working on trying to sequester CO2 at the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. I think it is, uh, it, it is one of the uh, options that I think uh, is, is uh, important to explore, but I think uh, it is also important to, um, to, to look into um, whether there are uh, possible um, negative consequences of biodiversity, uh, particularly uh, we know that uh, there are um, um, rich biodiversity even in the, uh, in the deep sea, um, and a lot of it are actually unknown. We are s just starting to discover a lot of this biodiversity in the deep sea. Uh, so I think um, I as we develop, uh, understand um, these potential options, it is also very important to, um, to make sure that uh, it doesn't have that uh, negative consequences uh, that would then um, affect uh, uh, this important biodiversity. All right, I think we had, did we have one last question, yeah, Professor? Here, yeah, it, no, just, uh, just we have one right here. So, Professor, de, uh, okay. Merci beaucoup. J'ai beaucoup uh, apprécié vos présentations. Very rich presentation, uh, in particular, your diagnostic and your prescription, but I'm still looking for the measure to be taken by political actors. And obviously, I'm a political scientist, so I'm very concerned by this, and I, I see a lack of interest on the part of people involved in party politics, and in fact, uh, people also on the business side, everyone wants to fish, everyone wants to bring the goods to the market, 
And then we see what's happening in the Atlantic region, for instance, on the issue of shrimps and conflict between communities, between the local inhabitants, between the Aboriginal communities, and the tension are extremely high because it has been overly fished. So um, the question is that, do we need Royal Commission, again, to examine this issue, to make it a real public event, a real public moment? Uh, because parties seems to be incapable of doing it. William referred to the issue of, well, perhaps if we do act individually, of course it matters. If we act locally, of course it matters. But then we know that there are states competing with one another and fishing in the territory of the other states. So how do we act? How do we intervene? How do we mobilize interests at the international level and going to the national level following that? Thank you. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think um, that's, that's really, um, really uh, an important point. Uh, and it, it, um, uh, Julie also mentioned about the point, for example, as an example of uh, international uh, management of fish stocks, uh, which involve uh, multiple jurisdictions uh, in managing a, a fish stock that are shared by countries. In the US and Canada, we have actually a, a number of fish stocks that are there. In, in for example, in the Pacific calendars, we have a number of fish stocks such as uh, uh, salmon, halibut, um, and that are managed uh, collaboratively between um, US and Canada. And a lot of the time, uh, we see the up and downs of these agreements uh, that um, it, it, it really uh, it boils down to um, the um, uh, dialogue, uh, collaborations, um, and, and, and the knowledge combined together, uh, so science information combined together to inform those discussions. Uh, uh, because we, uh, we know that a corporate um, a solutions, uh, if people are looking at like a kind of game theory setting, uh, that it will benefit for, for both countries. Uh, but a lot of the time, uh, the, uh, either the short-term benefits um, or some of the um, institutional barriers uh, have uh, lead to um, obstacles uh, in preventing uh, a corporate um, agreements between these different jurisdictions. So really, um, I think it is, it is, this is uh, a, a complex issue, but I think uh, a uh, combining um, an open dialogue uh, with um, informed by uh, um, knowledge and, and science and information um, and uh, is, is, is the prerequisite for having uh, effective solutions for that. But I guess one of the concerns, too, is that everybody says, well, even if I do everything that I'm supposed to do, well, there are all these countries out there that are just not doing anything, so what's the point? And I think there's some of that frustration because we are much more interdependent than we have ever been, I think, in terms of what's going on in the world and how we can address uh, those things. Now, there was a question. Did you mention that there was a question over here? Um, oh. Yes. So I have the benefit of being a layman and thinking of it from a layman's perspective, which I'm not used to. But um, it, so you've asked Professor Chang if you know where your food comes from, and um, I, I try to eat a lot of fish because I'm, I'm vegetarian, but I do eat fish, so I don't eat meat. And every time that I go to buy fish, I don't know whether I should go farmed or wild caught because I try to be uh, well informed, but um, no matter depending on which documentary I watch. Uh, fishing is great, um, and and um, farmed fishing is destroying the oceans because there is toxins and um, diseases that go around, or the other way around. If I watch a different um, show, and so um, my first, so I have a two-part question. The first one is, can you tell me which one I should buy? Um, and that's from a you know personal perspective. But then, as someone who might have levers as working at U of T, um, if if I don't understand. Um, can I help translate your science so that we can now inform government, so we can inform other members of the public, what is the best solution? Yeah, so this, this is a really, uh, really good question. So, and even sometimes I don't uh, fully know whether a seafood should be uh, a, cup, uh, a source that uh, are environmental, least um, acceptable to eat or not. Uh, and um, so I, I think uh, the easy um, answer to this is that um, there are um, a lot of uh, a number of uh, um, uh, credible um, 
organizations, uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, that try to provide that information uh, to consumers. Um, so they've done the due diligence of uh, assessing the scientific information uh, to understand, based on the best of their knowledge, whether it's seafood is, uh, is, is, um, is, is, is sustainable source or not. Uh, and and uh, some of it is showing up in some of the um, uh, the, the restaurant or seafood sources uh, that are for consumer. Like some, so some where of the would you go to get that information? Um, so they usually they would be post on the package or uh, on the seafood menu. Um, and it is very also very useful to ask the, um, the managers of the shops or to the restaurant um, uh, retail waitress uh, about that uh, because uh, even though they don't have those information, the consumer requesting that means that uh, they know, okay, this is something that they care about uh, and that uh, they would think about uh, having that in there. And, and in general, that I think uh, speaks to the point of the importance of uh, something that is recognized internationally um, called ocean literacy. So the importance that uh, people um, educate themselves about the oceans, about ocean sustainability, um, in order to make the decisions. Um, I eat farm fish. <laughs> 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 I admit it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, we don't have a lot of uh, wild, like for example, salmon and uh, trout. But you know, it depends. Like uh, that's probably like an area where it needs to be improved. Uh, like the, uh, the the way that the fim uh, the the fish uh, is farmed uh, on land or in the open ocean and so on. So there's a lot of research going on there. But like as William was mentioning earlier, like uh, for example, in Scotland. The um, aquaculture industry is in, in a lot of trouble for um, diseases, but also because of warming. So the warming, so basically the fjords are getting too warm for the salmon. So um, yeah, that that's also a problem. It's not just a problem for the wild fisheries, but also for the aquaculture industry. Okay, so we're a little over our time actually, but we have one last question. I know you were waiting for quite a while, so we'll uh, we'll hear your question before we finish. Thank you. For both sides of um, of the discussion, because it's very important to see a, a holistic view uh, of ocean sustainability. Uh, I think I'm going to probably bring the mood down a little bit because I'm a little bit more pessimistic, especially when it comes to policy. So I'm an undergrad here at U of T, and I did part of my undergrad at University of Victoria. So a lot of what you said kind of resonated, and focusing on policy and mitigation. Um, we've kind of been on this precipice for a while. It's not like this is something new. Uh, I come from the East Coast and remember very vividly um, one that's kind of used by, I think, every course that I've done <laughs> in ocean uh, conservation, and that is the, um, the collapse of the Northern Cod. So we've been here before. It's not the first time. We know the signs now. We know what we're looking for to see these collapses before they happen. And we still seem to be looking past it and thinking that, oh, somebody else is going to take up this mantle and somebody else is going to fix this problem for us. So there's obviously a disconnect between the science and the people who are making these decisions. And because the science is there, the science has always been there and the scientists have always been saying that these problems are there and we need to do something about it. But the lobbying and the industry seems to always kind of come first and so in both your opinions, how can we see that policy is actually going to take precedence, that it's actually going to take priority, and what can we do? Like for myself, going into this industry, um, just coming out of university next year, how can I look going forward to getting into this industry, and what can I do as somebody young in the industry to be able to make these changes and to actually have people open their eyes a little bit and understand that we're in a lot of trouble? So uh, I could take that uh, f to begin. Um, so, uh, like, I I'm just going to talk about the mitigation aspect. So, um, you know, removing carbon dioxide from the um, the atmosphere. Um, so the industry now is growing really, really fast. There's a lot of investment from um, f uh, well philanthropies, but also uh, just investors in general. Um, so the industry is very big. So the, the issue that's uh, taking place now is that uh, can the research and can the, the policy keep up? So can the government make the regulations fast enough to uh, uh, and sensible enough that, that uh, the, this industry can grow but safely? 
um, to try to resolve these problems because it, that's that's the like the bottom line is that we will have to uh, deal with the climate, the warming, if we want to solve all these other problems on the long term. Short term solutions are possible, but you know in, it involves the placement of people and so on. And um, another point that I want to make as well is that. Uh, uh, equity, equity in the, the climate change, you know, it's not just uh, in Canada, and uh, there's a lot of work that we need to do in Canada, but it's also around the world, because like what uh, William was showing, you know, there's regions that are far more impacted than we are, and, you know, people's migration and so on. So, um, yeah, so I think that it definitely the, the, the policy maker have to step up and, uh, uh, and start making regulation and talking with the uh, the researchers uh, and and the industry as well. So at, at, uh, right now, um, I, my, two weeks ago, I was at this conference in New Orleans, and then about a third of the conference was about marine CDR, um, and that's uh, I've never seen this before. Um, and then we had all the, the all the government agencies were there, NOAA, and uh, you know, and and so on. Um, so there's a lot a, a lot of concern about and, and a lot of action taking place at this stage in, in all directions? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's a difficult question. So I, I think particularly in the context of, uh, of Canada, the way that uh, in, in this specific case uh, about fisheries management, uh, the, um, the minister has a really big power in deciding on the, um, the decision, the discretionary power, um, even with all this, all the science that they, there is a decisions that may or may not be informed by science, and maybe because of the um, balance between industry uh, interests um, and, and various objective as well. Uh, but as of the time, um, the, um, those decisions are being made without too much transparency of like how much science are taking into account in making the decisions, how much uh, of this kind of, uh, the weight in, in terms of putting in societal interests or industry interests. Uh, so I think um, without changing that uh, way of decision making, sometimes it make it uh, challenging to, uh, to, to make sure that the science um, can, uh, can directly, um, uh, the, si the best science are used in those decisions and that the decisions are made uh, as a consensus of what is needed to do uh, for managing uh, those, those resources and, and biodiversity. Uh, we, we, we did a comparison um, with uh, the um, the, the decision making structures in the US um, and that's uh, much more uh, in some in many cases mu much more uh, transparent because it's really um, uh, dictated by the, the laws and, um, and, and and the legislation in there of how they they need to for example the way they need to rebuild fish stocks uh, the way that they need to declare a stocks to be endangered and and be conserved uh, is much more structured compared to um, the, the way that are being done in Canada. So I think um, it, it, it is beyond what um, my expertise is, but I think that's something that would need to be um, further discussed and see how it can be improved in order to, um, to, to, um, to improve that kind of decision-making um, process. Uh. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to thank you all for coming here and, and for those interesting questions. And that was a sobering but, but an important uh, last question for all of us as to how to affect the change that we all know we have to before it's too late. Um, so I'm going to ask Professor Deere to come up to do the closing remarks. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much. Um, I come from Ganawaga, just south of Georgiaga, Montreal, if you will. And we grew up... Um, reciting every day uh, when we were younger, something called the Ohondo Garibatekwa. I guess that can translate to something like words before all else, and it's a, it's a Thanksgiving address. And you would give thanks to a number of things that were important uh, to our community. And, um, and, and one of them uh, went something like this. Aguegu, aska dito atwet noni, ne guatnigula, tanun tieti nuaradu, ne onega shuma. Aradu means thank you or thanks, and onegashuma is the waters, uh, the, the word for waters, oneganos. Um, and um, I'm thoughtful of why we were thankful of those things and why we continue to observe the importance of water in all its forms to our ecosystems, to our, to our world, frankly. Um, the comments made by uh, Julie 
Yango, thank you for your contributions on phytoplankton and Dr. Chung's uh, contributions uh, in regard to seafood, really, really quite important. And they remind me of the words of a scholar from uh, the University of Alberta. He didn't make this up himself. It's sort of a truism amongst many, is that you need to think seven generations. Everything you do in this world now needs to be uh, thought of as affecting our, our children, their children, their children, seven generations from now. And uh, it's a truth that uh, comes to mind when I was listening to some of this really important work. Um, so, uh, Nyango, thank you for our panel, for, for uh, uh, sharing your knowledge, and I hope everybody will share in some applause. Uh, thanks for their contributions. I want to again thank uh, Principal Rose and the Massey College community for hosting us again today. Not the last time we're uh, converging again here in this room in May. Uh, we're looking forward to that, uh, that fourth installment, uh, which is in this case hosted by the Academy of the Humanities, and it'll be a discussion on freedom of expression. So we're really looking forward to that final one of the four series as they're being hosted here at Massey College. Uh, events like this could not occur without the work of some very key and important people. First, the folks at Walter House who are representatives of Royal Society of Canada, Russell McDonald, who's been here uh, helping with his leadership. Amelia, yeah. <laughs> Amelia Domoradsky, where are you? Right there, now go, thank you much. Chris Dragon, thank you very much, really important. I want to say, uh, Nyawago in my language, thank you very much. Joe Costa, you can't see him, but he's around the corner there on IT. Nyawago, thank you very much. Um, we mentioned, uh, acknowledged the presence of Muriel Leberge from uh, University of Quebec, uh, Ottawa. Uh, the uh, plan now is in place for your institution to be hosting the RC Dialogues in next year, by next year, I suppose I mean 2024, 25, and we are going to have four events just as we did this year, and they will be apportioned to the three academies in the college next year. So we're really looking forward to that. So Nyango, thank you for inviting us into your, your institution. With that, Nyango, thank you very much. Keep an eye out for the fourth installment, which is again occurring in May. Uh, and have a great uh, evening. Nyawa, thank you very much. <laughs>